They're members of the Buxmont Unita or Lower Bucks Unitarian Universalist congregation. So thank you for being with us. And also to Shannon Strain from our own music ministry. <laughs> So as you probably know, today's topic is entitled Sex in Church. And I wanted to tell you that I chose that topic because it's close to Valentine's Day and not because it connects with our theme of the month, which is hospitality. <laughs> Just wanted to make that clear. And because it is somewhat of an interesting topic, I want to give you a little bit more background on, on why I picked it and why it matters to me. Uh, and the story is that actually sexuality has been an important part of my faith journey for a very long time. In fact, since I was in seventh grade in the Unitarian Church of Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, and I took About Your Sexuality, the sex ed curriculum offered by my congregation. And it was the time that I point to when I realized that my faith is different than some of my friends. That I'm, le I'm learning about sexuality in a church and most of us, you know, my Catholic friends and Lutheran, like, they talked about sexuality in church, but the conversation was very different. Because in my congregation, we talked about real information and real things. We talked about contraception and, and other issues that that everyone talked about. And like so many of my peers who went through a program like that, I then became kind of the, the default peer educator for my friends who didn't have access to accurate information about what was going on in our lives. Uh, I went on then to become a, a facilitator trainer for Our Whole Lives, which is the comprehensive sex ed curriculum that we use now. And, and since about 2002, I think uh, I've trained somewhere between 100 and 150 people to lead this curriculum in congregations. And I've taught it myself. And it's also been a big part of my advocacy career. And uh, in fact, uh, as some of you know from the announcement on Tuesday, uh, I start a new position, which I'll be doing alongside this one for my time here as Director of Public Policy at the Religious Coalition for Reproductive Choice. So this will once again be uh, central to my professional career. I also want to say that in our tradition we have freedom of the pulpit, and so I'm able to speak about these topics that may not um, be typical ones for church, but we also have freedom of the pew which means that you don't need to agree with me. And, and in fact, I would never, um, being a Unitarian Universalist, assume that everyone in the congregation agrees with me on anything. So uh, I encourage you to, uh, to keep an open mind, and, and hopefully this will work out well for, for everyone. Our reading is somewhat on the lighter side. It's from Butch Hancock a Texas musician who helped launch the progressive country movement in the 1970s through a group called the Flatlanders. And so he writes, Life in Lubbock, Texas taught me two things. One is that God loves you and you're going to burn in hell. <laughs> the other is that sex is the most awful, filthy thing on earth and you should save it for someone you love. <laughs> and so from this reading, you probably get the sense that I, I do intend to have a little fun with today's topic. As, as one of my colleagues at a former congregation said, talking about sex is always funny, but talking about sex in church is even funnier. <laughs> Of course, my sermon is considerably more serious than it is funny, but as with many serious issues, I think it's helpful to be able to take a step back and relax. And so I chose that reading because I think Hancock brilliantly captures, in just two sentences, our society's utterly conflicted relationship with theology and sexuality. And at least by implication, he makes it clear that theology and sexuality are connected. God loves us, and we're going to burn in hell. And sex is the most awful, filthy thing on earth. But we should save it for someone we love. 
Now, I'm sure that many of us here today have at least intellectually strongly rejected the negative aspects of these beliefs. We reject hell and we reject the suggestion that sex and our bodies are dirty. And yet, and yet, these views are so pervasive and powerful that they still have a dramatic influence, influence on, on both our personal ideas about ourselves and public policies. And even within Unitarian Universalism, despite our, our strong historic commitment to liberal values and to science and to comprehensive sexuality education, according to my own research on this subject, we, we tend to engage sexuality pretty narrowly in one of only three areas. Supporting gay, lesbian, bisexual, and transgender rights, providing instruction for our children and youth, or dealing with sexual misconduct. We rarely talk about sexuality in general. And I think that's unfortunate. And here's why. I believe that sexuality can be one of the best and most beautiful aspects of our lives. And it can also be one of the worst. Issues and experiences related to sexuality can be tremendously important for us, from decisions about connecting with a partner or not, or having kids or not, to how we feel about our own bodies. And what, I ask, what is religious community for if not to address the most important things in our lives? For me, the question is not why would we address sexuality in church, but why wouldn't we? Why wouldn't we talk about something that can be tremendously important, is incredibly value-laden, and incredibly complicated? Why wouldn't we address it honestly and openly so that experience of sexuality is more likely to be beautiful than it is broken? Yes, there are risks for talking about it. But rather than thinking only of the potential costs of not talking about sex in church, I want us to consider the actual costs that we pay for not talking about it. The first cost is that we cut ourselves off from a tremendous source of healing and wholeness in an arena where many of us could use a little more healing and wholeness. If stu studying sexuality has taught me anything, it's that nearly everyone, literally every single person, will struggle with sexual health and happiness at some point in their lives, if not throughout their lives. If our religious community stays silent on the subject, then our faith becomes just one more entity sending us the message that our struggles with sexuality should be hidden. That sexuality is something to be ashamed of rather than celebrated. Unfortunately, our relationship with sexuality is badly damaged by thousands of years of sexism, racism, ignorance, arrogance, and fear. It's damaged by physical violence, and it's damaged by emotional and spiritual violence. And in Western culture historically, and in the U.S. culture currently, the single greatest source of our utterly dysfunctional relationship with sexuality is religion. And so how our faith community responds overall, our, our Unitarian Universalism writ broadly, how we deal with sexuality is incredibly important. The second cost of our remaining silent on this issue is that we let other religious groups and other theologies dominate the conversation. So I'm going to make a comparison that is perhaps a little unexpected, which is how our relationship with sex is some, similar to something in the world of Harry Potter. So in that series of books and movies, the central plot around, uh, involves the conflict between the boy magician Harry Potter and the evil wizard named Lord Voldemort. And Voldemort in that story is so evil that only a few people, like Harry himself, will even say his name. Instead, they call him you-know-who, or 
he who must not be named. I think it's time that we stop treating sex like Voldemort. <laughs> referring, it only, referring to it only with euphemisms or quietly like, oh, it's that which cannot be named. I think that only feeds the suspicion and fear around it. Silence reinforces the idea that sexuality is something bad, something too dangerous even to talk about. Now, our negative views about sexuality and human nature generally come chiefly from two religious sources. Augustine, who argued that original sin is transmitted through intercourse, which is why sex is evil, and Calvinism, which holds that humans are depraved, sinful creatures. And those two concepts are exactly what Butch Hancock is talking about in the reading. That's why our society's relationship with sexuality is so screwed up. Unitarian Universalism, thankfully, rejects both of these perspectives. In fact, our opposition to the doctrines of sin and depravity is central to the birth of both Unitarianism and Universalism. We affirm a fundamental worth to human beings and to human potential. We believe not in theologies of hierarchy and judgment and damnation, but in the fundamental unity of all existence and the transformative, saving power of love. And so when we let fear and negativity dominate our approach to sexuality, we're actually giving in to a misguided theological perspective that our faith rejected hundreds of years ago. We're letting decisions about a critical area of our life be dominated and warped by views that we don't actually even believe. Now the reason for this, in my view, is that we are not doing a good enough job of lifting up our own positive, healthy, religiously grounded vision of sexuality. And without this strong, compelling, accessible vision to pull us forward, we simply don't have the resources to, be a, to avoid being pulled back by our culture of fear and shame. Now our faith, I am pleased to say, has already done a fair amount of work to articulate a positive vision of sexuality. One of the best examples is our whole lives, or OWL, the comprehensive lifespan education curriculum that we developed jointly with the United Church of Christ. And the Our Whole Lives curricula are based on a set of values, and I, I want to read just a few of those values. Um, but before I do, let me remind you that since 1996, the federal government, the U.S. government, has spent over $1.5 billion, that's B billion, dollars on absence-only education that by law do not have to be scientifically proven, and by law cannot discuss contraception or condoms except to emphasize their failure rates. $1.5 billion. And so contrast that to what we teach in our curriculum. Here's just a sampling of the values from the, there's four main areas. Self-worth. Every person is entitled to dignity and self-worth and to his or her own attitudes and beliefs about sexuality. Sexual health. Knowledge about human sexuality is helpful, not harmful. Every individual has the right to accurate information about sexuality and to have her or his questions answered. Responsibility. All persons have the right and obligation to make responsible sexual choices. Justice and inclusivity. We need to avoid double standards. People of all ages, genders, races, backgrounds, income levels, physical and mental abilities, and sexual orientations must have equal value and rights. Now tell me, are these values that are only applicable to adolescents? Certainly not. 
They are sound principles for all people, regardless of age or any other classification. In my view, it will be a great day, a great day indeed, when each individual within strong ethical boundaries gets to choose the kind of behaviors and relationships that are right for them. But with sexuality, one of the biggest problems we face is the tendency to judge ourselves by what we think is normal, by our often deeply mistaken conclusions about what other people are doing or not doing. In this way, I, I think our, our relationship with sex is actually kind of like our relationship with the collection plate. The culture tells you that you should give, and it generally feels good to give, but sometimes you don't want to, or you just can't. Nor are you supposed to look at what the person next to you is doing, but it's hard to resist comparisons. Am I giving enough? Am I giving too little? Am I giving too much? Is this bill big enough? The reality is that a vast number of individuals and couples in this country struggle with sexual health and happiness. The problem is not having problems. The problem is that we're thinking that we're the only person or people that do. The problem is letting our society's broken relationship with sexuality stand in the way of our own wholeness. In my last year of seminary, I took a class entitled Sexual Issues in Parish Ministry. And one of the best sessions in that class was a presentation by a couple that runs a nonprofit called the Center for Intimacy After Cancer Therapy. Through books and presentations, the, the founders, Barbara and Ralph Arterowitz, have helped thousands, if not tens of thousands of people, deal openly and effectively with the sexual challenges caused by serious illness, injuries, and medications. Now, as a middle school, as our middle school youth learn in the Our Whole Lives classes, one of the keys to healthy sexuality is remembering to use the largest, most powerful sex organs that we have, our brains. So much of our healthy sexuality boils down to basic information and communication, and there are massive quantities of resources that can help. Here's an example of what a little knowledge an intention can make. Barbara and Ralph travel around doing speaking uh, about their work, and they told this story to us that a couple that they had spoken to at a conference um, had gotten back in touch with them to let them know how much their presentation had mattered. And this is what they said. They said that after hearing Barbara and Ralph speak about what was possible, with their sexual health and healing. The couple went home, talked for hours, cried, laughed, and made love for the first time in two years. Now healing may not be that fast or that easy for all of us, but I think it's a worthy testimony to what is possible with a little help. Now, before I move to the public arena, which I definitely want to talk about, I want to give a little bit more concrete detail about what I think it would look like for our congregation to engage more openly on the issue of sexuality. And I think one of the keys is recognizing that in order to open up, there are plenty of ways to talk about sexuality and maintain appropriate personal boundaries and privacy. I'm not advocating for an X-rated coffee hour. And really, the only time I can imagine it being appropriate to get personal on this issue in church would be in the context of classes or groups that are intended specifically to deal with sexuality where there are trained facilitators. This is serious work, and I think we need to treat it very respectfully. The congregation's role, in my view, is to help us identify and live our values and to give us positive reinforcement to take care of ourselves and our relationships, to seek help outside help when we need it. But the congregation's role is also public. 
I think it stands to reason that if religion has done a disproportionate amount of damage to sexuality in our culture, then religion has a disproportionate responsibility to be part of the solution. And right now, conservative religious extremists are waging an all-out war on healthy sexuality in this country. In our own Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, the governor signed a law in December requiring abortion clinics to meet new standards of buildings. They would require them to spend hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars just to stay in business. And this law passed despite the absence of support from a single medical organization. At the national level, the Obama administration's decision to require contraceptive coverage in the new health care law is being met with fierce, fierce opposition. Despite the fact that a recent study shows that 99% of American women use contraception, including 98% of Catholic women. And of course, in Rick Santorum, we have a serious contender for the presidency who's on record as saying that birth control harms women and society. Now, it's, it's tempting to think that the key to having better policies is just to educate lawmakers about the facts or the science. But the reality is this is not about facts or science. This is about politics. And in this case, political power and religious power are very, very closely tied. Which means that there is a great deal at stake here. And what we do matters. Whether we speak out or not, as religious people, really, really matters. Now thankfully, I have some good news as well. Just this past Friday night, the Maryland House voted to support marriage equality legislation. Yes. And with strong support from the governor and an expected friendly vote in the Senate, it is very likely that Maryland is about to become the eighth state to end marriage discrimination against same-sex couples. And there is no way that that legislation would have passed had it not been for an enormous amount of religious organizing in support of it. Religious organizing led by hundreds and hundreds of Unitarian Universalists and several of my clergy colleagues. They made an incredible difference on that issue. Now on a more personal level, the UU Church of Arlington has taken the bold step of taking that Our Whole Lives curriculum out into the community in a program they call Owl Out. And they're taking it to places like Beacon House, which is a UU community ministry in Washington, D.C. Listen to what Angel, a ninth grade girl, wrote in an essay about her experience at Beacon House. Similarly to the many college programs at Beacon House, the sex education programs are very helpful as well. They have allowed me to know more about myself and feel comfortable in my body. Programs like Our Whole Lives give me important information to make correct decisions in my life. With these programs, I am a much better person. Ultimately, that's what all this is about. It's about knowing ourselves. It's about being comfortable in our bodies and having the resources and the motivation to make good decisions. If you're struggling with sexual wholeness and happiness, I encourage you to take whatever steps necessary to find healing. You are beautiful and you are worth it. Don't let the lingering remnants of bad theology get in the way of your health and well-being. We need healing. Our relationship with sexuality is troubled. It can be one of the worst things in our lives, but it can be also one of the best. We can encourage sexual health. 
we can encourage sexual happiness, we can work for reproductive justice if we're willing to talk about it. If we're willing to challenge the fear and the shame and the bad theology. If we're willing to lift up a positive vision of sexuality for ourselves and for our world. The question, I believe, is not why would we, but why wouldn't we? Amen. I invite you to rise in body and or spirit and